So Dominic Thurban, thank you for joining us today and thank you also for agreeing to participate in our Chartered Accountants Business Forum 2016. So one of the core themes of Business Forum 2016 is connected intelligence. When you think about your experiences working with large organisations around the world to drive change, what does connected intelligence mean to you? We see connected intelligence as a concept at sitting right at the heart of competitive advantage, both for individuals in organizations, but also for organizations to compete in the market. For us, connected intelligence goes a long way beyond um, just being like an interesting label that we put on things. It really is a business strategy. Um, so uh, in the in the mid uh, 1980s, a guy called Teichi Ono, um, who's basically the founding father of lean manufacturing, wrote a book about the optimal running of factories and he called it the seven mortal sins of waste. And there were all the things you'd expect from a guy who runs factories, right? So they were like time in transit, fuel costs, oversupply, typical lean manufacturing stuff. Um, a few years later, um, at the height of the transition to the information economy, this um, doyen of lean manufacturing wrote an update to the book called The Eighth Mortal Sin of Waste in Organizations. And he called it wasted human intelligence. He said that the number one thing holding organizations back from competing in the 21st century wasn't that they weren't smart or that they didn't have great systems. Um, he said that they didn't connect their people well enough to harness their collective intelligence. Um, and I would argue that he's 100% right about that. Um, the way we say it around the office is, if we all knew what we all knew, we'd be unstoppable. Um, and we have a strong belief that the ability to better collaborate, better share information, better work across silos, sits right at the heart of making organizations competitive in an increasingly disrupted economy. Dominic, you talk about the imperative for organizations to drive change rather than manage change. Can you explain what you mean by that? And, and also, could you give some advice um, to people to understand what they can do to successfully help drive change. Yeah, it's funny, you know, you can't move at conferences for streams on managing change. It's like everyone's favorite thing and has been for the last 25 or 30 years. But what's really weird about that is that we're 25 or 30 years on from when change management became a thing and change management is still a thing. So if it worked that well, presumably we should be over it by now. But of course we're not over it because the reality is change is just ever present in organizations. And in fact, I would argue that the quantity and the pace of change are continuing to grow rapidly. And in that sort of environment, I think change management isn't enough. That good organizations manage change, but great organizations have found a way to become agents of the change. So no one gave Apple permission to be the disruptors instead of being the ones standing around going, wow, the market's being disrupted. They just decided to, right? And in every market, you've got all these organizations standing around going, how are we going to respond to disruption? And you have one or two who put up their hand and go, we're going to be the disruption. Um, and I would argue that organizations that can understand not just how to manage change, but how to proactively design and engineer change to see the changes they want to make and then make them are going to be the ones that get to design the competitive environment rather than just have to respond to the competitive environment. And I'd say exactly the same thing applies to individual leaders in organizations. It's the classic proactive reactive dichotomy. Some leaders sit back um, and ask themselves how they're going to manage the change that's around them. And the more enlightened and the more effective leaders go, what's the future that I need to make happen here? And what are the five or six things I need to do to design that environment and, and, and will it into reality through effective management and effective change leadership? Um, and, and that's the distinction. I think um, making change rather than managing change is about being more proactive. It's about being more deliberate. And it's about inserting yourself forcefully but um, respectfully into the conversation, into the situation. Right. So, so that's that's really a, a mindset thing. Um, is, is that something that organisations can be coached on? That individuals can be coached on? How, how do you, how do you see? organizational ability to learn those things? Uh, 100%. It, it starts as a mindset and it actually starts even lower than that. I think it's about getting three things right. The first is um, a clearly articulated position where people openly talk about their beliefs and assumptions about change. Um, because at that belief and assumption level, a lot of people have irreconcilable differences, but we don't talk about our beliefs and assumptions a lot. So it actually starts there. Then it goes to mindset, which is based on these beliefs and assumptions, how should I think about and approach the world? And, and then the, the giant layer that sits at the top of that um, is what are the skills associated with that? Um, and leaders who can drive change have a different skill set 
to leaders who don't. They know how to have different sort of conversations. They know how to build different systems and leverage different structures. They implement different processes. Um, but it's all a learnable skill. And the entire point of Changeonomics, which is our framework, is to make change less art and more science. Um, and the leaders who know how to drive change um, have articulated their beliefs about it. They've developed a mindset based on those beliefs that's a constructive and useful mindset, and then they've gone and learnt the skills mm -hmm. of driving change. So you talk about the word changeonomics. For the layman amongst us, can you explain what you mean by changeonomics? Yeah, um, the marketing guys thought it was a good title. No, no, no. <laughs> um, the uh, never trusted agency. Uh, the uh, no. So changeonomics um, was created as a uh, basically as a direct response to this trend we were seeing away from managing change and towards making change. So changeonomics is a framework to make change happen. Um, and the thing that sets it apart is that whereas many of those frameworks are, um, are, are kind of based in the, 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 I suppose, the art of change, the belief that underlies changeonomics is that um, it's a science. It can be broken down in constituent, into constituent elements. The change is a process that can be driven and engineered and that so long as you learn the right skills and exhibit the right behaviours, you can create predictable outcomes. You can never guarantee perfect outcomes and you can never, there's no such thing as like one formula that works every time, uh, you know, in this space. But what there are and, you know, in, in the spirit of science, and which is where Changeonomics kind of lives spiritually. In the spirit of that, um, changeonomics comes from the presumption that if you uh, replicate or design processes based on good evidence and do the right thing in the right order, you give yourself the best possible chance of engineering the best possible outcomes. So you used Apple earlier as an example, but large organizations around the world are recognizing the need to drive change, not just react to change. Um, what first attracted you to the research on the topic? Well, so uh, my organization, Carricans, um, uh, works in about 15 or 16 different countries around the world designing very large scale behavior change programs. So we came to this space through research about, about the neuroscience and neuropsychology of human behavior. So our first projects actually weren't enterprise projects, they were education programs. So we work with about 750,000 kids a year in behavior change programs designed to change the way they think and act. Um, so we work in areas of financial literacy, which is of great relevance to, uh, to chartered accountants, obviously, but um, financial education and financial literacy behaviors, technology, cyberbullying, health and wellness, healthy lifestyles, healthy eating. Um, and our research started at the behavior change level. And then we noted something really interesting, which is everyone was talking about culture in organizations, but culture is a bit of a cop out really. Like culture is just an aggregate average of the way people behave. And so we thought, what would happen if you applied a behavior change lens to enterprise thinking? Like what if you treated people in organizations as actual people rather than like data points and started building change programs that were deliberately designed to change the way people think, act and buy in organizations. And we found that you could have great success applying the principles of human behavior to large scale organizational change. So our entry point was through research into the neuroscience of human behavior. Um, and then we kind of learned a lot over the last 10 years about the way organizations behave as well. Um, so yeah, short answer, research background and being massive psych nerds. <laughs> Excellent. What influence do you think that innovation and collaboration has on the future of work for finance and business professionals? Yeah, I, so at risk of rolling out a relatively uh, trite Turnbull-esque Turnbull <laughs> aphorism, um, my genuine personal belief is that it, there's never been a more exciting time to be in finance. And I genuinely mean that um, for the reason that if you look at the very particular type of change I think that's affecting enterprise really broadly, um, it's a very particular type of disruption that we're seeing now. And it goes beyond just kind of channel disruption and it goes beyond um, kind of, you know, brand disruption. It really is business model disruption. Um, the compounding effects of uh, digital technology, um, increasing competition in markets, changing labor force dynamics, they all come together to, um, to not just r make businesses rethink their products and services, but rethink the very models that sit at the heart of those products and services. There are literally, particularly like digitization is a great example, there are entire business models that cease to exist mm -hmm. given that type of disruption. And so what we're seeing now is, um, I think every CEO that we've, we've worked with, and most of our clients are CEOs, um, every CEO kind of asks themselves the same two questions, right? Which is number one, how do I extract every ounce of value out of my existing legacy business model? 
And two, what's the next model going to look like? And you can only answer both of those questions with finance at the table. So I think whereas some may have incorrectly, in my opinion, in the past seen finance as a kind of a procedural um, cost center in the business that crunches the numbers. I think what we're increasingly seeing smart organizations do is finance is becoming a strategic partner to help decode and understand what the business models of the future will look like, what those answers to question one and two might be, which is why I say that of all the, of all the times in the last 15 or 20 years to be in business, now is where I think we need to expect and demand more of our finance functions, but also on the other side where they can like, make these amazing contributions to helping businesses understand what their future looks like, which is why I reckon it's a pretty amazing time to theme a conference, not around technical disciplines, but to look at what does leadership in this space really look like? Authentic leadership and, and strategic thinking and, and, and design mindset is because I think those are the three things that are going to sit at the heart of what finance needs to bring to the table in order to enable businesses to make the sort of changes they need to make. So you mentioned earlier that business models have changed. Um, the ability to drive and react and manage disruption is becoming incredibly important. So what were attributes of a great leader maybe 20, 30 years ago are not necessarily the case today. But if you had to pick three attributes that you thought were important to making a great leader today, what would they be? That's a wonderful question. And I, I wouldn't for a second pretend to have the definitive three answers um, as much as people like to say they have the definitive three answers, but I think there's a few things we can say for sure. Um, number one is that uh, humility has never been more important. So the primary reason we see a lot of large businesses fail is they just believe their own hype. They, they, they've written the same press release and the same marketing collateral and been to so many of their own offsites that they genuinely start to believe they are the world's leading provider of XYZ, that they're too big to fail, too big to be disrupted. And they carry that egocentric view all the way through past the tipping point where things are salvageable and it's, you know, it, it, it's engraved on the tombstones of the business type thing. Um, so the first attribute I think is, is humility. Um, a lot of people talk about change as an act of intelligence or innovation as an act of creativity. I reckon that's all bollocks. I think change and innovation are acts of humility because they require a level of honesty to admit that the status quo, which we build ourselves, is imperfect and flawed and could be disrupted. So the first thing is leaders need to get super comfortable with being humble about those things. I think the second thing then is collaboration. Collaboration is a skill. It's not a, an abstract concept. Collaboration means getting, being able to work with more than one person to do something. And so you put humility side by side with collaboration. I think leaders need to learn to listen outwards to their peers in a way they haven't before. Um, they need to learn to listen downwards to um, colleagues and uh, and staff members in the organization who maybe have been seen in the past more as like a human resources rather than people with, with voices and opinions. Um, and they need to listen what, what I'm going to call like uh, upwards and outwards to industry trends and, and, and broader things that might be on the horizon for disruption. So um, I think if humility is number one, collaboration is number two. Um, and then I think thirdly um, is, is uh, the ability to drive change. Um, so to go beyond leaders who, who simply manage change or can operate in an environment filled with it and become people who have a skill set in, um, in architecting a very particular change. I think the where we're seeing businesses go and given the amount of disruption, there are very few businesses that are going to look the same in five years as they do today. And someone has to run that process like to get from here to there. Um, and so the ability for leaders to um, on, to get really practical about that, like to be able to articulate what the destination looks like, um, to be able to com to paint a compelling vision, um, to be able to build a case for why people should be thinking differently in in change averse organisations, um, those are really practical skills. Uh, and I think those three things together, along with all the unchanging things of leadership, you know, good people skills, good communication, all all the things that are the, the sort of eternal lords of leadership, I guess put them together and that's going to be, I think, what separates the very, very best from just the rest. So Dominic, at a personal level, what are you looking forward to at Business Forum 2016? I, I just can't wait to hear the different opinions. I mean, the, the great thing about the way the forum has been set up um, is I think that the themes and the speakers and the sessions are broad enough to cover a great range of things, but they're specific enough to be real conversations. I don't think there's gonna be a lot of like motivational platitudes and like general backslappy sessions. The way I think the forum's gonna work is real conversations from a wide 
range of people about genuine issues that affect leaders in the space and the sector. Um, and that sort of breadth of opinion um, and hopefully conflict of opinion, because that's where the magic's going to happen, I think sets that up to be just a fascinating conversation. So do you think there are tangible outcomes that people will be able to take out of your session at Business Forum that they can go back to their offices and implement today? Yeah, 100%. And the, the biggest thing I hope people take from my session, and I've, I've, I've flagged it in, in the conversation so far today, but um, the biggest thing I hope people take from my session is a willingness, um, a level of courage and a level of humility um, to challenge their assumptions about their job the value their job creates and how that's going to contribute to the future of their organization. Because it's in that moment where we challenge the assumptions that have been unchallenged for too long, where we're willing to put on the table in an honest and open conversation what's working and what's not. That's going to be the conversation that is the catalyst for the type of growth and change we're going to need to see, not just to survive, but to thrive in, in future years. So that's what I'm really hoping people take from my conversation. So thanks for your time today, Dominic. It's been great talking to you. We look forward to hearing from you more at Business Forum 2016. Thank you very much. Look forward to seeing you there.